Hey everyone, today we are ready to come to the lecture 1.6, which is devoted to magnetism in metals and alloys. This is the ta table of elements which we have shown already, have seen already. So here, ferromagnetics uh, materials are in red, diamagnetics in green, ferromagnetics in white. Antifar magnets are in gray, and here see Curie temperature and new temperature. So now good that we can fully understand this picture. And uh, the question is that you see these three guys here, iron, cobalt, and nickel, and all of them, they have Curie temperature above room temperature, and they are metals, as we know. And the question we have to answer, why particles, these three elements, are magnetic and not the rest. Because if you will have a look on this table, we're showing electronic uh, structure. So here is two shells, 3D and plus 4S, and all these elements, you just increase number of electrons in these two shells, one, two, three, and so on, up to 12. And then you see that in 4S, we have number of electrons, either one or two, depending on a favorable uh, energetic configuration. And in 3D, there is a different number, one, two, three, five, five, six, seven, eight, ten, ten. 10. And from all this, only these three guys are magnetic. Chromium and manganese can be antiferromagnetic. So as a question, why, for example, these materials are not magnetic? Yeah? In, in order to explain you the uh, nature of magnetism in metals, we need to remind the band energy bands model. I will go through it very, very briefly because you started it in past and uh, you have, uh, so there was memorization in the, so there was repeating of this material briefly in the part of uh, Professor Kotakowski. But the main idea is that if you have a single atom and then you put, uh, it has some energetical level. If you put two of them together, like we had in covalent bonding when discussed exchange interaction, you will get splitting of two, uh, you will get two energy levels instead of one. So it's also known if you will take resonator, any resonator, if you have one resonator with, and then put another one with the same frequency, put them together, the resonance frequencies will be pushed away. And then instead of one resonance frequency, you will get two. And then the message is if you put more of such atoms, you will have as many atoms, you will put together as many energetical levels you will have. And then at the end of a day, you are coming to metal where you have free electrons moving over the whole volume. And it means that you will have as many uh, electron levels as uh, you have uh, electrons and you can easily estimate it simply using our uh, Gadro uh, number. 10 to the power 23, so huge number. It means that and distance between energy levels here is very small. And uh, as a result, we do not describe any more our system with uh, separate energetical levels, but instead we are working with bands. And here you can see how these bands are formed. When you uh, put two atoms together, real atoms with many shells, and you put them together, D is the distance between. And you see if distance is large, then it's these are independent atoms and you speak about concrete energy levels. But when you move them closer one to another, then first 4S electron, because they are out of shell, they will start to overlap. And as a result, you get formation of the band. It's getting wider and wider as a more closer you're coming. Then at some point 3D, band will start to overlap and also will form a band. Therefore, and the inner shells usually are not, do not form because they are localized closer to the nuclear. They do not overlap, they still have here separate energetical levels. And then you have some D0 defined by crystallographic structure. So you just take this picture, cut it uh, along this line, and you have your uh, band structure. So talking about band structure, about free electron model, then the main parameter we have to introduce is density of states. Again, just repetition. So density of states, it's the number of states per energy, dn over de. And uh, 
there are different models, but usually we use a model of 3D electron gas. So we consider only kinetic energy of these electrons which are moving in 3D. And then it's rather easy, you can get a value for a density of states as a function of energy. So, and it's a square root of energy. And that's why when we plot this uh, energy, here G is missing, I'm sorry. And uh, energy, so let's ignore at the moment F, then you will get the, this GE as a function of energy is just such square root behavior. And that's where you always see this kind of bar parable. So that's where it comes from. And the second ingredient which we need to add is of course, how these states are filled. Because they are not filled, you simply do not have enough electrons uh, to fill it infinitely. And here we are using so-called Fermi Dirac distribution. So we are talking now about electrons. Electrons have spin one over two. That means this is fermion. It means we need to use Fermi Dirac distribution, which is shown here. And uh, energy minus chemical potential. So chemical potential, it's such a uh, physical uh, uh, parameter, which is equal to the energy which your system obtains or loses when you change number of particle one. So let's say you have some energy, you have so many uh, electrons, and then you take one electron and put in, and energy of system has grown. The question is, and so this, how much you have grown, uh, you increase the energy, it gives you chemical potential. And the last point is that we need to speak about Fermi energy. Fermi energy, so if your temperature is equal to zero, like shown here, T equals zero, that means that from all this distribution which goes further, all your electrons will fill all states from the lowest energy up to Fermi energy. Here, so it will be such a fully loaded. And uh, what happens if you increase temperature, electrons start to move. Some of them have higher, larger kinetic energy because of term thermal motion, some smaller. So you are smashing such this distribution. And it's very important because principally these electrons which are filled here, they usually do not influence your chemical parameters of your material. They are sitting if they want to go somewhere to change energy or to change spin orientation, something they cannot because due to Pauli exclusion principle for each electron, if it wants to increase energy, for example, yeah, there is already another electron sitting. That place is occupied. Therefore, electron cannot increase or cannot decrease or cannot flip its spin because Pauli exclusion principle always forbids us. And all properties are given by the electron sitting here in this electron range close to Fermi energy in the range of KBT. So the thermal energy, KBT, it gives you the width of this region and electrons uh, which are sitting here, they can jump from one state to another because there are uh, free space, free positions here. And uh, that's why it's very important to keep in mind that when we speak about uh, metals, we first of all keep in mind band models. And second, we keep in mind that we are talking about these electrons here. And Fermi energy, so usually uh, when we speak about temperature, imagine, uh, temperature equals zero, and then we add one more electron, and of course this electron will have energy of Fermi. That's why chemical potential pretty often is uh, made a kind of equal to Fermi energy, musical uh, Fermi energy. Because when you add one more electron, it has this energy, this energy increase the system. Okay, so this is just repetition, what you knew. And what we need to make different when we speak about uh, magnetism is that now all electrons, we have to split into two parts. We spin up and we spin down. And then instead of the standard picture, we are coming to such picture. So here you see G is the density of state. F is Fermi Dirac distribution and divided by two by two because uh, we split it all electrons in two, so we have 50% electrons here, 50% electrons here. And in this left side, we consider only electrons we spin up, and here we spin down. So usually this picture is turned 90 degree, but uh, it's done here for comfort that uh, you have energy access on the x axis. 
So this is uh, about energy uh, bands model. And now we are coming to paramagnetism. So how can we describe paramagnetic uh, paramagnetism using bands model? So and this uh, description was done by Pauli. So it's Pauli paramagnetism. And the idea is that we know that um, when we have some magnetic moment M, so it's like atomic magnetic moment, for example, and we place it in magnetic field with inductance P, and then there will be energy minus MB. So this is potential energy, and uh, uh, this gives rise to an overall paramagnetic susceptibility of the delocalized electrons. Uh, based on the Fermi Dirac distribution, which is called Pauli paramagnetism. What does it mean? It means that here, this is energy. This is our density of states multiplied with Fermi Dirac distribution. And uh, this is kinetic energy of electrons. But now, if you put an uh, additional magnetic field, we additionally add this potential energy. Magneton bore B, if we are talking about magnetic moment equals simply to magneton bore. And um, since electrons, so these magnetic moments for spin up electrons, so spin down electrons are pointing in the opposite directions. For the spin down electrons, which point in the opposite direction to the field, the energy is increased. And for spin up electrons, the situation is vice versa. Uh, favorable, favorable means always decrease in energy. And therefore, this shift, this band shifts down, and then we have such a situation that spin up electrons band is moved down, and spin uh, down electrons is moved up. Uh, why it's important? Because, as we know, for metals, uh, all the states are fully filled. And this is very important uh, for band model in general because when you want to describe some properties of magnetic materials or any other properties of conductivity, so you should take into account only electrons lie in the region close to Fermi energy within the range KBT energy. So there is such delta energy. Uh, and uh, why is that? Because power exclusion principle forbids us uh, jump of electrons from this region to this. So they principally are fixed there, they're kind of frozen, because for example, you want to change, you take some electron and you want to change its spin orientation. And you want to spend, change its spin orientation, you cannot do this because there is already electron with the same energy and its opposite spin direction. So Pauli tells you, Pauli exclusion principle tells you that no way, because its place is occupied. In principle, these electrons kind of do not define our properties. What matters only these electrons because they can always jump and change energy. Here, this state, you see there is all this area is, um, is not filled with electrons. So it means that electron from here can always jump to any of these positions. And KBT is a, a thermal energy which allows it to change temperature or to change energy, for example. And so that's why we have such a description, quite phenomenological, but uh, very clear. And then what we can define is the densities of states for spin up and spin down electrons, dn, so variation of number of density of electrons per energy for spin up and for spin down can be found then as, uh, uh, so this is uh, density of states, a multi, uh, at the point, energy plus magneton bore uh, B, so this is this additional potential energy when we put our paramagnet in the magnetic field. And for spin down, it will be minus. Besides, we have here this divided on two, that simply appears from the fact that uh, we split it all electrons to two, so spin up and spin down, therefore you everywhere see this uh, over two factor. Yeah, so it's written here, has been introduced because we are considering spin up and spin down electrons separately. Then in the Krishnan book, you can follow the states, but principally um, you can uh, define the paramagnetic susceptibility again by definitions M divided by H. And then 
it looks like magneton bore uh, mu zero three n zero so this is uh, original without application of field original density uh, of uh, electrons divided by two fermi energy mu zero appears here simply because of uh, um, coupling between b and field magneton bore one it appears because it's already staying here in this energy and uh, second uh, magneton bore is coming from magnetic moment uh, it's coming from uh, uh, thermal definition so we, we didn't discuss it here but uh, if you are interested in going deeper it's quite uh, easy to to get it as this formula but what is important for us is that now our paramagnetic material uh, susceptibility of this uh, band model is defined by squared magneton bore and as a density of states at the fermi energy so it means the more electrons you have at fermi energy the larger your magnetic susceptibility will be the more magnet magnetic your material will be and it brings us also to the another message that uh, magnetic properties of our metal are not defined by all these materials as we discuss all these electrons as we discussed but only electrons at the fermi level matters that is why it brings us to two qualitative important uh, conclusions first of all uh, the paramagnetic susceptibility of metal is independent of temperature. So there is small de uh, dependence that, for example, um, uh, yeah, the, the distribution depends on energy. Therefore, small dependence is uh, exists, of course, on temperature, but it's very weak uh, phenomena. And you remember that in uh, paramagnetism for isolators, which we discussed before, uh, on the theory, the uh, susceptibility was inversely proportional to temperature because it was an interplay between magnetic energy and uh, KBT, and there was a strict, very uh, strong dependence on temperature. Here, because we are working with bands and only some electrons contribute, the temperature dependence is not with us anymore. Okay. And so that's what we have here and yeah as i said since uh, imagine that you have a uh, uh, isolator and in each atom you have one uncompensated spin of electron like uh, I don't know, some argon uh, argentum so uh, silver and then if you have a co collection of such atoms then Again, uh, maybe silver is not a good uh, example because it's, it, it, it's metal. But if you would have some imaginary isolators, which consist simply of uh, neutral atoms, and then uh, this uncompensated spin, and each atom gives a magnetic moment of one Bohr magneton. And then if you will take magnetization, you will summarize magnetic moments from all atoms. It will be large because uh, number uh, of atoms will be scaled to this Avogadro number. 10 to power 23 and then you have multiplied with more magnetons so we will get quite large quite significant uh, magnetization now if you do the same for a uh, free electron uh, for uh, metals with a free electron model then if each atom gives you one free electron which is everywhere and then only these all electrons will not contribute to the magnetic properties since when you put it in the magnetic field does some changes they cannot jump they cannot change their position they're just sitting there that means that only electrons which are sitting within kbt or 2 kbt uh, re region of energies uh, give you magnetic response of this metal toward to the magnetic field therefore it brings us to the conclusion as that compared to the parametrical parametric susceptibility in isolators described by Curie law, uh, parametric susceptibility of Pauli is much smaller. Yeah, so it means that now, as said for metals, 
magnetic response, the susceptibility is smaller than for isolated. The only issue that we need to take into account that, of course, if it's just uh, iron uh, crystallographic grating, uh, then, of course, it's all fully packed and it's, uh, you still have kind of large density of atoms. But if you're talking about yttrium iron garnet, for example, material which is insulator, it's bright, but it contains uh, 160 atoms per unit cell. And only some of them, only iron three plus gives you magnetic moment. Moreover, it's organ, uh, arranged in a very magnetic state and three uh, iron three plus comp are compensated by two iron three plus in opposite direction. So for all this huge amount of uh, atoms you have, let's say for one chemical formula, uh, you have only one magneton bore and very large volume. Therefore, if you normalize it with uh, volume, which usually a crystal occupies in uh, isolators, then this difference will be not so drastic as one could think. Okay. So this was about paramagnetism. When we have no internal fields, we just know that uh, all magnetic moments, all ele electrons are independent. Now we are coming to ferromagnetism. Ferromagnetism, as Weiss has suggested, empirically it's a material where we have internal field. And um, internal field, as we learned already, it comes from the relativistic, from uh, quantum mechanical uh, exchange interaction. Uh, has Exchange interaction has electric nature. Uh, it's part of Coulomb energy, which is spin dependent. But yeah, this is just uh, additional information to that what I told you already. And now the question is how to take into account this uniform or molecular, uh, this internal or molecular field, QM, introduced by White, how we can introduce it into the band model. And idea is very simple. You just take uh, Pauli paramagnetism, as we just seen in the previous uh, slide, and you say that besides external field, we have a shift in this gaps also by the uh, by the internal field, or even to be more correct, it's uh, described like this is the best way. We now imagine that we are able to transfer a small number of electrons corresponding to a narrow slice in the energy of sickness delta E from the spin down band to the spin up band. So it's not really a Pauli model where you shift uh, these bands with spin up and spin down. What internal fields does, it just takes some of the electrons here and just place them onto the other side. And um, when uh, it does like this, then kind of potential energy, system, energy of your system decreases. But at the same time, you understand that if we move these electrons, so just exchange turned uh, the sum of our electrons, turn spin of electrons in opposite direction, then we, since these spectates are occupied, we had to place all these electrons with uh, turned spin on top. And on top means on this scale is kinetic energy. It means that we increased energy, kinetic energy of the system. What does it give us? It gives us the following. So first of all, again, we are speaking about the density of state uh, at Fermi energy and again, this factor of two since we divided everything, all electrons will spin up and spin down. How many electrons did we move? This can be easily calculated when you simply take density of state as a Fermi energy, so here, how many, and simply multiply it with uh, delta E uh, divided by two. So delta E, it's this one. Yeah, and divided by two simply, again, it's factor because of uh, well, stand here. So density of state should be always divided by two. And we increased and so and delta E, it's just set how many from this point, for example, to this one, we moved our electron or from both the top here, we moved to the top here. Therefore, the shift in energy is delta E and this is the number of electrons which are shifted. So now 
you can go uh, again, uh, I can refer to Krishna where it's all described in more details. Here I just give you the final result. And in the final result, as I said, you need to take into account change of kinetic and potential energy. So this delta E is the variation of the system uh, energy when we took into account internal field Y of Y. This is kinetic, this is potential energy. And increased in the uh, kinetic energy, you can find very simple. This is a number of electrons which are moved from one to another, and each of them increased energy by delta E. Therefore, you just take that one, multiply with delta E, and you will get here square. So this is a negative uh, situation for our system because we increase the energy of the system. The, kinetic, the potential energy uh, is vice versa. And that's why we will get here again this delta E squared. We will get this G, and so density of states at Fermi energy. And moreover, since we are talking here about internal field, here stands this wise constant Q, Q, which tells you the strength of this internal field. Therefore, you can come to this um, value. But uh, before we will go in there, it's named toner criteria. Uh, let me tell you that there is already uh, from here, we can directly get the value for the magnetization. Magnetization is simply will be equal as a magneton bore uh, multiplied with a difference in density of spin up and spin down. And um, with this one we can have directly from here because we know that we moved uh, this number of electrons from spin up to spin down. So this one and then we moved here. So in terms of spin we, uh, we multiplied. So we removed this number of electrons will spin down and we created the same number of electrons will spin up. Therefore, magnetization is simply the same value without these two. And you can simply write directly that mu magneton bore times density of states at Fermi energy times delta E. First, yeah, so this is a change in the potential energy is simply minus uh, B minus M B field B. And then instead of a uh, field, we put, first of all, from switch from B to H, we put this mu zero. And instead of H, since this is our internal field, uh, by by as, uh, power of, as Weiss described it, we have placed instead of H, we have placed QM. And second M stays here. That's why you can immediately get the value for the potential energy. And from here, you can get this value, which is placed here. So you can come from general magnetization, you can bring it back to the density of uh, states at the thermal energy and the delta. Okay, so this is formality, how we can get a uh, magnetization, but what physically is important, as I said, very important that system minimizes its energy. What you have to do, you really just have to say that this part is smaller than zero, and then you just you can sort of remove this delta E squared, you remove one of G at the Fermi energy, and with the simplest mathematics, you are coming to such value where mu zero Q internal uh, surface parameter uh, squared magneton bore and the density of Fermi level, then it's pretty often rewritten all this part, mu Q and B, mu B uh, squared is named atomic exchange in integral and simply replaced with u. Therefore, the toner criterion can be defined very simple, that you have this density of uh, this atomic exchange integral, which more or less shows you how strong is exchange interaction, how strong is your internal field, but you should multiply it with the density of states at the Fermi level, and this should be smaller than, uh, larger than one. Only in this case, you will get spontaneous magnetization of your metal, at some given temperature. Usually people speak about room temperature. And this is the main picture which I wanted to show you it's just about stoner criterion per magnetism. Because as you remember, the question was the following. Why I tell you all this? That there is a huge amount of elements uh, which are power magnets, uh, diamagnets, 
uh, and only three of them at room temperature are ferromagnetic. And the question, what's wrong with this, guys? Why copper is not ferromagnetic or this one I did? So what we need, therefore, the answer is, gives us a stoner criteria of ferromagnetism. Because if you will check, so here is atomic number plotted. So it means these are different elements in the periodic table of elements. Lithium, natrium, uh, yeah, rubidium, palladium, and so on. Now here's iron, cobalt, nickel, all different elements. And if you will look now on the exchange integral U, you see that it's stronger for lithium and stronger for natrium than it would be for iron, cobalt, nickel. So principally, if there would be no stoner term of ferromagnetism, and you would say that, come on, we just need to have strong internal field uh, in order to become spontaneous magnetization at room temperature, then all these materials would be magnetic. But the stoner criteria of ferromagnetism gives you the answer that no, it's not the only uh, requirement. Other requirement, you need also to have large density of states, which I have hidden here, so it's G at Fermi energy. So you see that we have simply not enough electrons at the Fermi level for these materials. Therefore, when you take this picture, you multiply it with density of state, you will get this bottom panel. And if this is our one, which is stoner criterium, and it shows you that all these materials, the multiplication of the exchange integral with the density at the Fermi energy is below one. It means that these magnetic materials, that these materials are not magnetic. And only three in the nature, iron, cobalt, and nickel, if to speak a bit about pure metal, a room can be magnetic. And then when we go further to the following materials in the periodic table of, uh, of uh, elements, then we have principally decreased exchange interaction and decreased density of state. So this is such a nice uh, criterion for ferromagnetism. And um, uh, this is explanation why only the three metals are magnetic, which I find is very interesting to understand, especially in the course of advanced materials. And we're speaking about magnetism. And then what we can have, we have this um, uh, uh, yeah, sus magnetic susceptibility of ferromagnetism. Then it's again M over H. And here it's like Pauli paramagnet uh, susceptibility of Pauli, but we taking into account this additional uh, exchange integral, which is staying here at the bottom. So principally, susceptibility of ferromagnet, as we know, is larger. Okay, so I hope we have general understanding now how to describe magnetic properties of metals. And in the next lecture, we will speak about magnetostrictive materials.